Joining us for tonight's event um, is American Democracy in Crisis. My name is Chaylin Jung, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brown Undergraduate Law Review, which is Brown's entirely student-written and run journal of legal scholarship. Uh, we are thrilled to be co-sponsoring tonight's event with the Watson Institute, and I would like to introduce tonight's distinguished guests. Uh, first, we have Ambassador Norman Eisen, is, who is a co-founder and executive chair of the State's United Democracy Center. An attorney and author who has served in a broad array of government roles, he was special counsel and special assistant to President Barack Obama for ethics and government reform from 2009 to 2011. In that role, the press dubbed him Mr. No and the ethics star for his tough anti-corruption approach. You can see I'm much more pleasant than that Mr. <laughs> no longer. Following his service in the White House, he was the ambassador to the Czech Republic from 2011 to 2014, where he was noted for his rule of law and other initiatives. His books about the Czech Republic are The Last Palace and Democracy's Defenders. He served as special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for the impeachment and trial of President Donald J. Trump from 2019 to 2020. His memoir of the impeachment is A Case for the American People. Eisen is currently a senior fellow at a DC think tank and a legal analyst for a cable television network, in addition to his duties at States United. His writing has frequently appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, USA Today, and CNN. He has been named to the Washingtonians' most influential people, Politico 50 and the Forward 50. Eisen was the inspiration for the crusading attorney, Deputy Kovacs, in Wes Anderson's movie, The Grand Budapest Hotel. That's the best part. <laughs> just skip all the rest and get right to the movie. Um, also joining us is Attorney General William Tong. William Tong is the 25th Attorney General to serve the state of Connecticut. Assuming office in January 2019, Tong is the first Asian American elected at the statewide level in Connecticut. As the son of immigrants and small business owners, Tong knows firsthand the constant pressure on Connecticut families, squeezed by expensive health care and prescription drugs, ever-rising utility costs, the high cost of housing and education, and many other expenses. Since taking office, Attorney General Tong has become a nation le national leader on a range of issues. Most prominently, Attorney General Tong has taken a leading role in the fight against the opioid crisis. He has championed strong legal actions against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and other bad actors that have created and fueled the crisis, most notably the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma, makers of OxyContin. Tong has also become a national leader on antitrust enforcement, pursuing strong actions against large corporations in the pharmaceutical and technology sectors that abuse their pro positions to put profits ahead of consumers. Prior to his service as Attorney General, William Tong worked as a litigator with private firms for 18 years before being elected as a state representative in the Connecticut General Assembly, a seat he held for 12 years in which he was the chairman of the Judiciary and Banking Committees. Attorney General Tong resides in Stanford with his wife Elizabeth and their three children, and way too many pets. Um, so I will now turn it over to um, maybe Ambassador Eisen. And, and the most questions. important details, number one, I'm not in a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> yes, but, but not number, yet. But number two, 85 brown, 95 right. brown. Yes, so brown that's also. the most important detail. And we mm -hmm. wanted to come talk to right. you. We right. said, oh, wouldn't it be fun, because we're friends, we said, wouldn't it be fun if we go talk to the law? Mm -hmm. Society of Brown. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you for thank being you, here. Well, thank you, Thank you. So now we'll go back to where we were before the introductions. <laughs> uh, so um, the, the, the mention of my ambassadorship, and Patrick and Cynthia were kind enough to come visit me when I was abroad, that was what really woke me up to the fragility of democracy. Uh, and it was a one-two punch from m my mother, uh, who was a Czech Holocaust survivor. Mm. And she, uh, the house where the U.S. ambassador lives in Prague was the headquarters of the Nazi Wehrmacht in World War II, the occupying military force. Uh, and they were the same... Uh, those same occupiers who sent my mom and uh, her family to deported them to the concentration camps. She loved to tell people they took us out of there, the Nazis took us out of there on cattle cars, and my son flew back on Air Force One. That was my mom's line, the topper. When she got together with the other moms, that was the line she used. Um, and um, And she 
constantly told me, and I, I wouldn't listen, she constantly warned me not to take democracy for granted. Mm -hmm. She says, we had a democracy in Czechoslovakia too. And uh, then I got there, and the second thing was the great Czech political leader, Václav Havel, who took me under his wing. He took every new American ambassador, and I needed it more than most. Uh, I, I had no diplomatic training or expertise or inclination, really. I'm not a very diplomatic person. You're pugnacious. But, uh, I'm too pugnacious. Uh, and I like to say what I think. Uh, so he took me under his wing, and I was so amazed. He warned me in the, the fragility of democracy the same way my mother did. And almost the same words. Of course, they were two Czech uh, survivors of the 20th century. Um, and, and when the wheels started to wobble on the bus of American democracy, I, and I'm very interested to hear, we'll, after General Tong talks for a little bit, we'll hear from, we'll ask all of you some questions. We'll hear from you. But they were the two people I thought of the most. They had both passed by election night 2016. Mm. And I do not say this in a partisan way. Mm. I actually volunteered to help candidate Trump. I have a thing I, in my areas of government law. I always help the Democrat and the Republican get ready for the transition. Um, but they were the two that I thought of on election night. This is the person who's going to be in charge of our democracy. I didn't know right away mm. how it was. And then it became clear mm. the crisis we were going to face. So that's the beginning of the crisis for me. So I also, I was slow. In on election night 2016, I was reelected to my final term as a state legislator, so my sixth term. And, you know, I was in a good mood. And um, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, and then it was clear that she wasn't going to win. And I, I got a lot of crossover votes that night. And so I got up on stage in front of a hotel ballroom full of supporters, including my wife, and I said, you know, thank you so much for the sixth term in the General Assembly. I want to thank all the Republicans who voted for me tonight. I'm a Democrat because I thought it was important to show that I had crossover appeal. And then I went too far. I said, and I want to thank the 1,000 Tong Trump voters who voted for me tonight. Crickets. Everyone was like, what did he just say? And I looked over, and our local party chairman was like this, shut up, shut up, shut up. And that night, afterwards, I didn't get it, right? I went out with my wife for a drink afterwards because she was in tears. And I thought she needed, a, you know, she needed a, something to drink. And so we went to a local bar, and she's bawling. And I was like, Liz, what's going on? She's like, you don't understand. This is really, really bad. And I think a lot of Americans didn't quite understand. I thought it was all an act. He would go center-right, typical businessman Republican. And um, I ended up being very wrong. And then fast forward uh, to December 2020. Um, and and uh, I, I've had a lot of really good moments as attorney general. I've had a lot of tough moments. The the last uh, week in June of this past year was a really bad moment, those three days in the Supreme Court, uh, Brew and Dobbs, West Virginia. Um, and we can talk about those cases too if you'd like. But um, I think the toughest moment was December 2020. Uh, I, I, we were late getting a Christmas tree. So I, I, I took Liz and the kids in the station wagon and we went to um, a local Connecticut a supermarket chain called Stu Leonard's, and we went to buy a Christmas tree. So we're walking around the parking lot, and I got a, a call on my cell phone from the Deputy Attorney General. It was Friday night, and I picked up. I said, what's up, Peggy? And she said, we got to get back to work. I said, Peg, we don't have a Christmas tree. Like, I got to buy a Christmas tree first. What's going on? She said, 
18 Republican attorneys general have gone to the Supreme Court seeking to overturn the results of the presidential election. We got to get back to work. And Norm was on the bat phone, right, when that happened, on the red bat phone. And we went back to work. And we stopped them in that moment. But in case anybody is wondering, we were looking into the darkness in that moment. It was this close. And this, this election close. was this close. So let's talk about a little bit how we worked together in 2020, a game of inches, and what's just happened in, in 2022. So um, the, um, uh, William, why, why don't you describe the coalition that came together uh, to respond to the threat. Start with we, how did we, when did, you know, as so, bad as Trump was, there was a moment when he signaled to us all that it was about to get worse, dramatically worse in 2020. So, was that for so for us, there was a sense, nobody knew that they would actually try and hatch a plan to steal it. Uh, when we started, we were concerned about political violence. We were concerned about shenanigans. We were concerned about misconduct. But I don't think we yet understood the scale of the threat. And so, but what we did early on was we put something together called the Voter Protection Project, and it was spearheaded by Attorney General Maura Healey um, to our north, who is now the governor-elect. And um, her chief deputy, Joanna Lidgate, they sounded the alarm. And a number of us, me, uh, my civil rights guy, ultimately was seconded to work <laughs> for Norm. Um, uh, Josh Shapiro, now governor-elect in Philadelphia, uh, in Pennsylvania, sorry, Josh Stein of North Carolina. A bunch of us came together and said, this looks like it's going to be bad. But for me, it was when we first started to see and hear about the so-called Rutherford B. Hayes scenario. Mm. And I think it was a New Yorker article, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the idea that even if President Biden won certain states that were controlled by Republican state legislatures, that um, those state legislatures might seek to impanel slates of electors that would vote for Donald Trump. For those uh, who haven't uh, recently um, uh, dwelled in uh, 1876, yeah. <laughs> uh, Hayes and Tilden uh, were the modern precursors. It was the first American election crisis. They, uh, it, uh, nobody knew who won that election. Uh, and um, they, it was a very tragic uh, turn of events. Um, Reconstruction uh, was teetering anyhow. And there were competing presidential electoral slates from a number of the states. And ultimately, a commission was constituted. Uh, and um, a, a bargain with the devil was made in which Reconstruction was ended in the southern states, control was ceded back in exchange for recognizing uh, the Republican Hayes instead of the Democrat, the New York Democrat, Tilden. And it was such a national trauma that um, uh, they passed the Electoral Count Act, which still, that same law that gave us such headaches in the last election and that now perhaps in this lame duck Congress they'll, they'll um, fix. And when was the first moment that you took seriously, hey, they may try to do an end run around what the voters have decided? Again, I think... Uh, what, what, about what date would you say? That I seriously thought it would yeah. happen? Not until after the election. After the election. So we were ready, very honored that we st we stood up this voter protection program to consider all the possibilities. And I will tell you, for me, by now very cynical, I opened, uh, I have opened 
500 legal matters, over 500 legal matters against Donald Trump, including the impeachment. For me, the moment when I saw how far he would go was, and this was when we started working together over this, on this issue, over the summer of 2020 when he attempted to interfere with the mail-in ballots. Mm. And that was a sign to me, and actually did, that the, the post, there was litigation and there had to be court supervision of the handling. The, there was a judge, very distinguished federal judge, Emmett Sullivan in Washington, D.C., who was overseeing the Postal Service handling of all the mail-in ballots nationally and the post the 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 post postal service was reporting to him well we have this many in this post office and this many over here and he was saying he was ordering them you get those ballots delivered by such and such a date so i thought if donald trump is willing to break the mail-in delivery of these ballots how far will he go um, but then, of course, we didn't, you never know when you're in an election crisis. You don't know. And that's really where I thought about the countries where you had seen a coup. We were very concerned. William and I talked about the, at times the possibility that Trump would stage an actual military coup. I think we were even more concerned at times about that that people loyal to him would actually physically seize power. And, and this is, I think, underscores how significant that, that Rubicon is, right? That they were willing to cross, again, into Rutherford B. Hayes territory, Hayes Tilden, that they were, they were, they were willing um, and tried to execute a plan um, to, to get states like, like Pennsylvania and like Michigan and Wisconsin to appoint electors contrary to the popular. Do you know what's so interesting to me? Because we know that the issue of military intervention was raised in the Oval Office uh, by Michael Flynn. He mm. came in with uh, Sidney Powell in mm. that infamous December meeting when Sidney Powell was all uh, temporarily for a moment was appointed as a special counsel to handle the election. Uh, Flynn, Powell, um, uh, Patrick, uh, Byrne, the bad Patrick, from, uh, <laughs> from Overstock.com, the founder of Overstock. They, Flynn told Trump, declare martial law, seize the machines. Uh, and yet, of all the terrible things that happened, and what ultimately happened has been described as an attempted coup in search of a legal theory, a coup in search of a legal theory. And it was an attempted coup, not with tanks, guns, and soldiers, and bullets, but instead with lawyers, cases, statutes. It was a coup using the law. That's why the lawyers are in so much trouble now. I've filed complaints against a bunch of them. The successful complaints, investigations have been opened. But they never went so far as to attempt military intervention. Why not? I don't know the answer to that question, why not? I think uh, probably because the practicalities of it were, um, were a barrier. They were insurmountable. The Mark Millies of the world were not going to comply to John I Kelly's think that's of the right. world. Because I, right. I think if they could have done it, it would have it would have been a much more serious risk. Do you think Trump would have done that if he could? Yes. It, because, and again, I've already said I'm a little slow, right? And I was a little slow on election night 2016. But I think when it really hit me full throttle, right, in the face was when he summoned legislative leaders from states like Michigan to come to the White House and to try to get them to execute his um, Hayes-Tilden plan. Um, that's when I was really, really scared. And this is, I learned a really important lesson that, that you know, I hope we think about and revisit a lot um, in whatever you do. It reminded me that democracy is not self-executing, 
right? It requires people to do the right thing. And, and I remember asking in law school, raising my hand in, in, in first year, no, second year, raising my hand and, and asking, well, what happens as a matter of constitutional structure? For example, if a court issues an order and the president doesn't apply, right? And the professor looked at me and said, well, what do you mean what happens? I was like, well, what happens? And he said, well, you're potentially looking at a constitutional crisis. And that's what we're looking at. If, if democracy doesn't just happen, people have to play by the rules. And one of the most consequential moments for me was when I saw on CNN, I saw that um, Trump had called Chris Carr. Chris Carr is my Republican colleague from Georgia who just won re-election. And we're on opposite sides. I worked hard to defeat Chris Carr um, just last week. But we're friends. And I saw that um, Trump had called him, and he called um, Kemp in Raffensperger. And I don't know, it must have been late December or somewhere around Throughout there. December yeah. and into January. So, so uh, CNN, you know, the... The ticker or whatever and says that 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 he called Carr. I waited a couple hours, and I it was clear that Carr had not folded, that he didn't roll, didn't do what Trump wanted. Trump and, wanted him to join this Supreme Court case that we were talking yeah. about, that the AGs, the re, some Republican well, and, AGs, and brought. engage in much more misconduct than that. He, I mean, he wanted him to do whatever he could to throw the vote in Georgia <coughs> to him. And so I called Chris two hours later on his cell phone, and he picked up. And I said, hey, Chris, how's it going? He said, it's rough, man. When the President of the United States calls you on the phone and rips you a new one, it's really tough. And I said, well, I just want you to know that I appreciate you and the country appreciates you. <clears throat> and he said, thanks. That means a lot. And before we hung up, I said, and please tell Governor Kemp and Secretary Raffensperger we appreciate them, too. I mean, for me, that's like the twilight zone to say those words. And I said them, and our country held together because people did the right thing. And it was bipartisan. I like to say that there, but for a couple dozen Republicans, judges, members of election canvassing boards, governors, AGs, Secretary of States, there were... A, a, a relatively small number of people, and this comes to the miracle of our Very democracy, small. but how close it was. I'll give you another example of one that I dealt with. Has anyone here ever heard the name Aaron Van Langeveld? Yes, but you tell him who it is. <laughs> he was the Republican, one of two Republican members yes. of the Michigan Board of Canvassers. And it's a very similar story to the Chris Carr story. He was under intense pressure. The two Democrats wanted to recognize that Biden and Harris had won. The, the voters had selected them. And uh, the two Republicans on the Michigan Board of Canvassers, and one of them was Norm Schenkel. He's the bad Norm. <laughs> uh, and Norm Schenkel is a hardcore Trumper. And he did not want to recognize the election. And it would have been, I did the research, it would have been a very complex, very dangerous thing if the board, it's not obvious that we could have forced the board to recognize who actually won under Michigan law. And Aaron Van Langeveld, Republican, uh, very conservative Federalist Society type of person, worked for the... Um, uh, speaker. Of, he was a staff lawyer. He was the staff lawyer yeah. for one of those Michigan legislators who was called to the Oval Office. Yeah. So he was under intense pressure and nobody knew what he was going to do. And we were speculating and asking questions. I was trying to find out. AVL, he was, what is AVL going to do? And uh, they're having this uh, meeting of the canvassers and presenting the and citizens are coming in and speaking and there's an argument you should recognize you shouldn't recognize and then Aaron Van Langeveld says look under I didn't vote for Biden but I took an oath 
the Constitution of the United States, the Michigan Constitution, the laws of Michigan, I'm a lawyer. I don't have a choice. Biden won. He's Norm Schenkel is, you know, arguing. He says, I don't have a choice. And he did the right thing. And a relatively mm -hmm. small, that was the miracle of the, uh, the democracy, democracy crisis part one. And it ended that, uh, 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 it, it ended the the democracy crisis. We thought, but but you said it was a handful of people, and I'm going to disagree with that a little bit. It, it it was one of those people. I don't know who it was because we'll never know. But the reason why I say that is, if one of them had folded, yes, absolutely. If just one of them had folded, all hell would have broken. The loose. domino effect. Right. Right. I mean, we. That's why we were so nervous about if, Michigan. If AVL was, had folded, if um, hi girls, um, if AVL had folded, if one of those state legislatures had folded, if um, Camp or Governor Ducey, yeah. these are hardcore GOP people, but they they held strong. Well. Even Governor Brnovich, Deuce. your 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 uh, fellow AG Brnovich, yep. do you agree with him on anything? Zero. But he did the right thing, Arizona AG. He did the right thing on uh, when it came. He to did the, the right thing. Ducey did the right thing. Ducey was until now presidential timber. You know, he was considered to be a real legit contender for the presidency, and I think one would argue threw it all away because he did the right thing. Kemp, now Kemp. He's looking like a genius now because because he did what he did, Georgia voters, you know, center right independents are like, eh, he's kind of reasonable. And I think it inured to his benefit. So that's how we felt on January fifth. And I'm sure we talked on the third or the fourth or the fifth. I talked to the AGs. I said, Well look, here's what's gonna happen. I wrote a treatise with some other constitutionalists. Um the January a guide to the January sixth meeting of Congress. Now, by then we knew the pressure campaign was on, um, and you'll see if you look at that, you can find it on the States United Democracy website that we talked about all the uh, what we now know was the criminal scheme and why that was illegal. Yeah. Why Pence did not have the power to recognize the fake electors. Why the fake electoral slates <laughs> were fake electoral slates. Why they were illegitimate. Why it would be wrong for members of Congress to vote against. It's all there. Uh, we, we knew what was coming, but we did not expect a violent insurrection. I don't know about you, but I did not expect a violent insurrection that no. day. So part of the theme is that the just as the um, just as the the resilience and the durability and the miracle of democracy hanging on by these tiny whoever that one person was it was each of them any one of them could have set off the avalanche right if Michigan had refused then Arizona the pressure might have been too great um, well, if and, and, you have that miracle by the same token then. You know, there there are surprises and shocks to the system. And and the 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 miracle though it happened in in those December January moments, the risks popped up again, right? If Pence had done something crazy, right, in the US Senate, um, and uh, if there had been different points at which people had done the wrong thing, um, the consequences could have been profound. So that brings us to the 2022 20, miracle. You had election. I told everybody. I was optimistic. And I put, we have a new book out from myself, Joanna Lidgate, who uh, General Tong just described to you. She was formerly the number two in Massachusetts. And Republican, former governor, former Bush cabinet member, Christy Todd Whitman. The three of us are the co-founders of this organization that grew out of the conversations we had to get ready for 2020. <clears throat> we wrote a book, States United, a, a survival guide for our democracy, talking, and it's an optimistic book. 
and we predicted that democracy would survive the turmoil of 2022. But if you had said to me, Norm, here we are, it's the end of November, we're getting, it's the week before Thanksgiving, and not a single one of these election deniers in the key swing states who were running for the offices that control elections and basically hinting, and some more than hinting, that if they had the chance to redo 2020 and 2024, they would make sure that Trump or a candidate of their party won this time, irrespective of the votes. Not a single one of them in the swing states had been declared a winner in any of those offices. I mean, that is a miracle. And it's not a part, you heard, I worked on the Trump, I was helping the Trump campaign. I've helped, I've worked for Republicans. I'm from an era in Washington when you were friends, like your friends with Chris Carr. I started this organization with a Republican governor, Christy Todd Whitman. It's not a Republican reflection. As, the, as President Biden said, this is not your mother's Republican Party. It doesn't even, it's like a hostile life form that has invaded the body politic. It doesn't, it, 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 it is something, this election denier phenomenon is an American autocracy. And it's like the miracle, soon in my tradition, the miracle of Hanukkah. It's like you had... 18 election deniers, and not a single one, not a single, so far, we'll see what happens. There's one left in those state offices. So how do you account for the complete rejection other than this Arizona AG race where we're watching? It's a few hundred votes separating the election denier who's slightly trailing from the non-election denier. And they're both Republicans, by the way. Mays was a lifelong Republican who felt alienated from her party and switched to the Democratic I Party. I wish I could say the durability of our system. I wish I could say the resiliency of our system. That's partly the answer. We got lucky, honestly. In a couple of places, we got lucky. I, I will tell you, I was in the war room of Democratic Attorneys General for the last two months figuring out which races we were going to fight in and which races were not looking good and where we were going to deploy our resources. And a lot of the races that we ended up winning, they were goners. And um, that's the honest truth. And God bless the American people, but I, I think part of it is that, part of it is the durability of our institutions, and part of it is... America got a break. And I think the reason why I say that is because don't go popping champagne corks. We caught a break, okay? I don't think for a second that just because the last few days uh, Republican elites are down on Donald Trump that this story is over, right? He's been doubted before. And if it's not him, you know, others have shown, this is galling to me, by the way, the the DeSantis's and the, the, the J.D. Vance's of the world and the Josh Hawley's, who, by the way, all went to Ivy League schools, okay, in the Northeast. Let's just be clear about that. Blake Masters, too. You know, they were all educated here. They claimed that living amongst us radicalized them, which is absurd. And, 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 and I think any one of them is capable of this treachery. There, I said it. Treason. Well, uh, as William knows, um, the, for me, the, it's a vindication. Of course, I agree with your assessment. It is a vindication of the wisdom of the American people. And we had a big debate um, about... Uh, whether anybody cared about democracy. And many people said to me, because I'm pushing democracy as an issue, many people said to me, no one cares. That's an elite construct. Okay, we're not, it's not politically salient. A lot of the consultant class and the cynical 
Paul's in Washington. And it reminded me of when I was doing the impeachment. You know, it took me a year to uh, get enough uh, votes, I've written a book about it, to get enough members of the Democratic um, majority uh, in the House of Representatives to impeach. And uh, it's not that people didn't think Donald Trump was unfit, but they didn't believe in the salience of the issue. Mm -hmm. And so I think the American people really spoke to that. Abortion, very important. Dobbs, you mentioned it before, certainly very important. But this was the Dobbs and uh, democracy midterms. And I agree with you, we can't be complacent. And I, at Brookings, I track the election deniers. Uh, not just these, the good news is these, the ones who were running in the bullseye to control governor, secretary of state, AG, to control elections in our key swing states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, um, they got wiped out. Pennsylvania wiped out. Um, the uh, but it's not unmitigated good news because a total out of I track three over three hundred forty at Brookings, two hundred twenty four of them won their races. We now will have the United States House of Representatives, mm. the majority in the House of Representatives. Uh, will be, and, and again, it's not a partisan, of course I am a partisan, but it's not a partisan uh, reflection or analysis. I welcomed Kevin McCarthy when I was ambassador. He spent days with me. My adversary, I cut my teeth on impeachments in the Clinton impeachment as a young lawyer, and uh, my adversary, Congressman Dan Burton, who was a very notorious, he was the most, he was the Jim Jordan and the Matt Gates of his day, rolled into one. He came to visit me, and at the end, we spent days working together, because politics should stop at the water's edge, we're all Americans. And at the end, we had a party in my house, a cocktail party, and he toasted me, he says, Ambassador, are you sure you're not a Republican? We work together so well. So this is not a partisan reflection. But that caucus, that majority that's going to take over the House of Representatives, a majority of the majority are election deniers. They're people who say, either say that Donald Trump won in 2020 and it was stolen from him, or who voted to question unquestioned uh, electoral outcomes who are otherwise uh, meet the criteria. And that is, a, that is very dangerous. It takes leave of the evidence. It takes leave of the law. There's no factual basis or legal basis for it. And it takes leave of American values and morality. Because the whole foundation of our system is that the voters choose their leaders, not that the leaders choose themselves. That's what gives legitimacy at the most fundamental level to the whole American project. So it is, in my mind, and they have a majority of the majority in the House of Representatives. Through another one of these miracles of democracy, every time democracy succeeds, that's what I've learned in this time of crisis. That's the flip side of my mother and Havel warning me that Czechs are very pessimistic. They've had a rough century. And now the, they warn me about Russia too, my mom and Havel. The Russian bear is on the move. Oh, mom, come on. Stop being so dramatic. Then I go there and the former president of the country says the same thing. You are too soft on Russia, you and Obama. I want you to call Obama and tell him as that's my greeting in Prague. Did you, did you do it? Uh, kind of. <laughs> kind of. I'll tell that story. Uh, I'll tell that story another. I went back to the Oval Office and I, you know how I communicated with President Obama when I was? I would go back to the White House every month. I had worked in the White House before I was ambassador. So I'd go back every month, month and a half on business and yeah. I would go see him in the Oval. But he read my blog. The first time I went to see him, him and my other friends from the administration, the president, you know, they came, he has a computer, 
He says, Norm, come over here and look at this. And they were all there laughing, snickering, and he had my blog up, right? He's like, you know, you, you don't know anything about being an ambassador. And they critiqued my first ambassadorial blog. Anyhow, the, uh, the point is, the, so when I wanted to convey something to him, I would sometimes blog about it. I ended up, this is a whole other story, but I ended up on a, a kind of a mission as ambassador to fight r the Russian takeover of the Czech energy sector because my mom and Havel, you know, radicalized me to these threats against democracy. But the flip side of that Czech pessimism is the miracle. As you say, we got lucky. I say it's the miracle every time democracy succeeds. So now when I see even a routine success of democracy, just a good election in the states where it was your election in Connecticut, you got a very large margin in Connecticut. Uh, well, it's, and it's not a foregone conclusion no, in no. any of these states that you have to fight you know, for it. You got to fight for it every time. That is that is a little miracle. But this cycle, we got a big miracle. So, um, and we can't be complacent. We have to, you know. Now we need to gear up. We just were meeting in D.C. We were together and talking yesterday. We had a good long chat. You know, what are we going to do in the years ahead to? to protect this fragile, miraculous well, because, democracy. And, and one of the things we debated, and it's super inside baseball, but um, when I became an attorney general, we worked very closely together, Democrats and Republicans, and we never had a problem doing it. And we joined together in a national association called the National Association of Attorneys General. Now that institution is under attack yeah. from within. And so, you know, just in our little community, we're not getting along like we used to because of these, in my view, Trump, MAGA, anti-democratic forces. And that's a huge problem. Um, and it's not getting any better. So it's, we need to take this miracle, um, as the ambassadors called it, and, and, and take it as a good karma timeout, right, to give us a chance to, to strengthen our institutions. Hopefully, you know, in this lame duck session, they'll take up the Electoral Count Act and, yeah. and strengthen it and do what we can to avoid a repeat of 2020 and 24. I was very honored that the Senate asked me to testify mm. because of the work we did together to testify what do we need to do to improve the laws from the Hayes-Tilden aftermath? What do we need to do to improve those laws I think we need to, uh, you need to, right now the law gives too much power to rogue governors. N none has ever tried to abuse it, but the power is there to declare a failed election. What does that mean? Mm. How, how would you go about it? That's that, that has to be fixed. Obviously, the, um, the vice president's role, it's murky under that law. We need to make clear what is the role of the vice president. Uh, putting in a layer, the courts came through for us. Whether they were Trump-appointed judges or Obama-appointed judges, Democratic or Republican, the courts came through. I was involved in a bunch of those cases. 64 wins, one loss. I was also involved in the loss, unfortunately. But it wasn't a material one. It was on a side issue. It had nothing to do with fraud. So the courts really came through. The system held, and of course, what's special about 2020 is, um, in tw uh, uh, is that as we've talked about, this handful of people, maybe one, whoever that was, each one of them could have brought down uh, the system. The system ultimately held. What was special about 2022 was we put it to the American people. Do you want democracy? Or do you want trumpery? And the American people responded against all the pundit predictions, against all the polling, against all the cynical political efforts. Our faith in the American people and their belief, not every single one of them, of course, but a supermajority of the American people came out from state to state to state. And, um, and so now we, we need to take that momentum 
and uh, we can't be complacent. And I'm concerned about complacency. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're talking to people in Georgia. You know, the, the activists in Georgia are saying, well, the rest of the country isn't focusing on us the same way they did in the last runoff. They're not helping us as much as they should. They're not as, say, well, we have the Senate. So, you know, it's, but it's a big difference between 50 and 51. It's a big difference. So in Georgia, they're already feeling, well, our, is the rest of the country a little complacent? So we have to guard against that. Very hard. That's why we wanted to come talk to you. And now we want to take a few minutes to listen to you about where we've been, your thoughts about the origin of the crisis, its peak in 2020, what happened in 22, where are we going in 24 and beyond. The floor is open. Um, this is less a legal question, more of a political question, but what do you think happened uh, to uh, you know, the American electorate when it came to judging the quality of candidates? I mean, Mitch McConnell himself said that there was a, a huge depreciation in quality for senatorial Candidate candidates. Quality. And like, you have someone like Herschel Walker, who was a great football player, but has no business being uh, a senator. Where it's a good college football player. Yeah. <laughs> like what do you think what do you think happened in terms of the quality because I think I think this was a function of the miracle. I think by and large the American people made an assessment. And they didn't always get it right. But you know, for example with Katie Hobbs and Kari Lake. Um, Katie Hobbs didn't run a great campaign. I'm I'm I'll just say it. I'm a Democrat, like she wasn't lighting the world on fire. And she refused to debate Carrie Lake. That was tactically difficult. Um, just wasn't a barnstormer. And Carrie Lake, she's very talented. Let's just, let's just acknowledge that. Um, and I think the people of Arizona who have had a tough time, you know, um, getting it right, they just looked at the two of them and they're like, nah, <laughs> I'm going with boring. I'm going with Katie Hobbs. And, and enough of them said that. And I think that's what the American people came through time and time again. It wasn't a big margin, though. No, it wasn't. It wasn't, which is why it's a bit of a miracle. Um, the, uh, truly, you, you almost have to, uh, you have to imagine if the more, you know, Ron DeSantis, wow. he got a huge margin in Florida. Um, he campaigned with these election deniers. He campaigned with Doug Mastriano. He campaigned with Kerry Lake. He has election police, so in some ways, and you know, he his election police arrested 20 re returning citizens. He's a quality, he's viewed as a quality candidate in Mitch McConnell's terms. Uh, they arrested 20 returning citizens, former felons who've had their rights restored in Florida, who were told they were told by the state of Florida in various ways that they could vote. Many of them asked, are you sure I can? Yes. They were sent ballots. They called, asked, and then their, their election police show up arresting. I've seen some of the video. They're ashamed. The election police are ashamed to be uh, arresting these people. It's so terrible. The first, it's totally unlawful. The first case was just thrown out of court. It was a pre-election gimmick to to jack up that margin in Florida. He just had another case thrown out today on uh, First Amendment grounds where he's trying to muzzle academics in Florida. It's a naked violation. I mean, Ron DeSantis has total contempt for the First Amendment. We are very lucky for the sake of the miracle. So uh, my point is, he's no better than these election deniers, he's just smarter. No, they're those guys are the those guys are profound. And dangerous. he's no more respectful of the rule of law. He took those. He had a scheme to take lawful asylum seekers from Venezuela in the United States and trick them. Yes. And basically kidnap them, and and uh, fly them from uh, Texas, why is he even meddling with migrants in Texas for a campaign gimmick? Fly them from Texas to Martha's Vineyard and they get off the plane, lied to him, 
get off the plane, what are we doing here? That is so reprehensible, the most vulnerable people. So he's no better than Trump, but he's, he's more dangerous. We're very lucky for this miracle, this miracle that we cherish, that, um, that the qual more quality candidates, you know, that there were, we're lucky there were not more Ron DeSantis's uh, instead of more, there were a lot of Herschel Walkers. Yeah. A lot of Herschel Walkers. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, uh, so um, that is the, it's the gang. My answer is it's the gang that can't shoot straight. They cannot get the people. Maybe because these ideas are so abhorrent, uh, you can't get people who will embrace those ideas on a whole, wholesale basis. But watch out for Ron DeSantis. He's going to give a very tough fight to Trump. And uh, he's very, just looking at the record, very dangerous, maybe more dangerous than Donald mm. Trump, maybe mm. more dangerous. McConnell. Yes. Um, what do you think it'll take to get back to what you're talking about, where Democrats and Republicans are friends and associate like that? Um, and are there any Republicans that seem interested in doing that? Sure. Um, there are a number of my colleagues. Mike Hilgers is uh, coming in to be Attorney General of Nebraska. Um, Chris Carr is somebody that I can till, still talk to. Um, we work with, uh, you know, Christy Ty Whitman and Bill Weld and people like that. Now, some of those are a little past their expiration date, you know, in terms of having a national platform. And so you have to hang a little asterisk on some people that served in a different time and a different era. But I still think that there are people that care deeply about our institutions. Um, I don't have a magic... Um, answer to that question. Um, we talked about this earlier, the, the undergraduate law review folks. Um, I think you need a little empathy and a little understanding of where people are coming from. And um, that's just not like be nice to them, understand the trauma that they've experienced and how they grew up and where they come from and acknowledge that and see them for who they are. One of my very best friends is a from my synagogue president of my synagogue fantastic president consensus builder dear friends our kids grew up together we spend a lot of time together hardcore trump support mm -hmm. he, he can't complain he's had any trauma he hasn't lost his job he retired with mega mega stock options so he's in you know beautiful family um, and uh, he's a strong Trump supporter and it's so normal you're talking to him and you're having a nice conversation and then he turns to that now his wife is a very strong Democrat so they don't talk politics anymore and my wife says please don't talk politics with so-and-so when we go over there for lunch but I enjoy I give Poke him, as we, say, as we say in Jew, Yiddish and Jewish, I give him a zetz. You know, I'll uh, it'll be some point after the scotch comes out when I'll give him a little zetz. And I like to set it up and I'll, you know, I'll say something like, boy, those, those crazy, those crazy, that Carrie Lake, she seems crazy to me. He'll, he'll say, what about the 2,000 mules? And he believes this. That's a movie about how supposedly they were. And, you know, so here's my approach. Uh, and then I'll say one thing. Is he's a friend, and I'll say a thing political about political Republicans I work with. Um, one, I believe, I learned this from John Lewis, late great John Lewis, who mm. said to me, I wrote about this in my book, he, when we finally had helped assemble these votes. And my job was, yes, to do the lawyering, but my brilliant friend, Jerry Nadler's chief of staff, uh, Amy Rutkin, really hired me also to do a trial lawyer by training, to persuade, to advocate, all Democrats in Congress know me, one by one by one to bring them over. Amy would send me out, and I'd say, okay, what's my list for today? 
And I would talk and persuade, and we did eventually. We had some help with the Ukraine scandal, but we did eventually bring a sufficient number of Democrats over. Um, and uh, John Lewis said, and I had a hard time persuading John. And he was a friend of mine. He was a mentor of mine. I would say to him, you're my mentor, John. He'd say, you're my mentor, Norm. I'd say, you're my hero. You're my hero. I said, come on, I'm not your hero. <laughs> A wonderful, modest, just one of the great Americans. And and finally, he, I passed him in the hallway. He says, Norm. He grabbed me by my arm. He says, Norm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm, you persuaded me we're going to do impeachment. But I want you to do one thing for me, Norm. So what is that? He says, impeach him with love. <laughs> and, and I thought, I said, okay, John. I was so glad we had his vote. I said, okay, John, I'll do it. And then I thought, I went home, I talked to Lindsay, I'm like, what did he mean? What did he mean, impeach him with love? What does that mean? And I think what he meant was, if you study his career, the civil rights movement, you can't take on board the hate that you're getting. And you have to understand, you have to meet the person where they are, you have to understand them where they are, and somehow you have to see past that hatred. It's actually, it's not my faith. I think it is actually a very Christian, it was in John's case, very part of his very deep Christian faith. Um, I'm, uh, my own attitude is a little bit more of an eye for an eye approach. Uh, but, You're but, but I'm, that's where we started. That's where we started. But, uh, you know, but I think there's some great wisdom in love, humor, a light touch. We actually commissioned a bunch of research on how do you talk to, how do you get to the Trump voters. And one of the most effective ways, humor, uh, joking about some of their beliefs, that brings down the defenses. And I don't think, now look, I'm not talking about the hardcore, obviously, the hardcore killers. Okay, we're not going to you know, even then you should be sorry, I think, that somebody's life, I mean, I don't feel happy that these insurrectionists are getting long jail terms. I'm sorry at whatever happened to them to make them a violent killer. I'm glad they're getting, <laughs> going to jail, but I feel sad what happened to them. But for so many, we were just talking about this at the Obama Democracy Forum today, 10, it's like the Trump Tong voters writ large. 10 million Obama Biden voters swung to Trump. Were they wonderful people when they supported us and now they become demonic monsters? So, you know, you have to understand. And many of them do have, unlike my friend, many of do, them do have repetitive life traumas, some of which were caused by democratic insensitivity to the you know, some of our big ideas, my book, Democracy's Defenders, is about this. We don't always, we have these big ideas on the coasts. We don't always think about the impact they're going to have on the real lives of people in the rest of the country. And um, so there's plenty of blame to go around for the conditions that have created this. So I say treat them with love, treat them with respect. And, you know, you can still privately get along. I get along great with Mitch McConnell. And, and, and challenge what you think you know and accept and embrace that we get it wrong more often than we admit. And, you know, one of the great experiences of my life is that I went to the most conservative law school in this country. And I was very lucky to have a con law professor that shared my view, um, President Obama. But, um, but I was taught by ground zero for the Federalist Society. And that made me sharper, you know, and also helped me question, well, yeah, you know what? Sometimes the conservatives have, a, have, a, have something to say, and we don't always have a good response. Okay, last question. Sir. So first off, I, I do have to say, as a, a resident of the state of Nebraska, I'm very sorry that um, Mike Hilger is, will be, is one of the best options you have because I've never been particularly impressed by him, unfortunately. But hopefully he proves to be better as the, the next AG. The bar is not particularly high at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> He's fair. burning from, is he yeah. in Nebraska? Yeah. Um, but so I was, I was a little curious um, because I, I agree with a lot of what you're sort of saying regarding, you know, 
ability to have friendships sort of in, in private. I can say I have a number of friends who are Trump supporters from various places. Uh, but in curiosity, what do you sort of view as the role of, let's say, sort of the, not quite the auxiliary to political, but sort of the, the, uh, the rest of society and helping to bring us back to a more sensible sort of position? Because I feel that that's um, one thing. And we can talk a lot about, like, we need to be focused on sort of the political side of things and, and getting things back together. But if we're not working together in outside of elections, it doesn't feel like it's going to get places. And it does sort of feel like a lot of... Capital animals. needs to respond. And I, I, I think in many ways, Steve Schwartzman, Ken Griffin, those guys, Jamie Dimon, you don't get a pass, guys. I mean, um, you, you can't, in, in uh, you know, marketing, mass marketing to the public and um, building our company, say we care about equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice, and ESG, and the climate, and climate change, and then fund Kari Lake's campaign. And so I, I feel like um, one, of the, one of the constituencies that has not been pressed is capital. It's mm. people with resources. You know, uh, business was a um, strongly responsible actor in the 2020 aftermath. Business reinforced this. They were also, including some quite conservative ones, were also part of reinforcing democracy. Uh, but then uh, when the crisis, when it appeared that the crisis had passed, there kind of was a reset. And there was a little bit of coming away from the field. I think that we need to your question points to, and really the, the, the prior question as well uh, about how to, how to work with and get along with Republicans really points to a deeper kind of the permanent crisis. And I don't know when this fire will burn out. Um, that, you know, there is a, in a sense in our country, we have never stopped fighting the Civil War. Yes. And there is a tension um, uh, it, that is, it was written into the Constitution that we treated some humans not as humans. And in various iterations, um, you can see the arc of American history. Obama's particularly eloquent on, on this point himself um, uh, as a black man. You can see the arc of American history of the expansion of the acknowledgement of all of our humanities. Uh, and, um, but there's a struggle there, and, and you can't ignore uh, the racial aspect of uh, this continuing conflict. You know, we've talked about election deniers and the democracy crisis. We talked about Reconstruction. Uh, the birth of Jim Crow was in the democracy crisis of 1876. That created the permission structures. And we still haven't uh, fully overcome that. So I think we need to continue. That is going to be a very long-term uh, process. And even if you get past this MAGA moment, there still is that, um, there still is that, that, unhealed wound within the American body politic. But I will say, I'm going to end on a, uh, on a hopeful note. I'm going to end on a hopeful note. Then I'll, I'll, I'll pass to the general to end as he sees fit. Um, I will say that the, the, uh, that the overall trajectory uh, is positive. When I, one of my, I, I had a very odd portfolio of, I had kind of the mainstream of my work as special counsel and special assistant to the president uh, in the White House. And then I had some cats and dogs, issues that fell in my portfolio just because I was friends with the president and the first lady. And one of them was accepting the donations or paying for the furniture, <laughs> the, the furnishings in the White House and in the, their private quarters above the East Wing. 
And uh, the president, uh, so I was involved, you know, furniture manufacturers want to donate everything and you can't take it all, right? So you have to negotiate and you got to review the contracts and the prices and is there a conflict of interest? And there's legal issues around it. So I was involved in the rug and the, uh, the, the procurement of the rug for the Oval Office. And Obama decided that he wanted to have <laughs> woven into the rug uh, his favorite sayings, some of his favorite and most inspirational sayings. And one of those sayings was one that Dr. Martin Luther King loved to quote, um, and uh, it's from a 19th century clergyman, that the arc of the moral universe is long. It's long, but it bends towards justice. And that, that trajectory as tough as the struggle is, as many crises as we've had, as many more. You've heard us say, get ready for 2024. Fasten your seatbelts. We need you to help us get through that crisis. Um, I do believe in that, in, in, in that moral arc. Uh, of, I, I won't speak to the universe, but I believe in, in that American bend towards justice over time. And we have a lot more work to do. And that's, that's, it's a matter of evidence. Uh, but for me, as you've heard, child of a Holocaust survivor and a Holocaust refugee, and I came here, and then I went back to live, I'm, I'm representing the United States in the house. It's the headquarters of the Nazi Wehrmacht that sent my mom and her family to Auschwitz, murdered my grandparents, most of my family who I never met. And I went back representing the United States. We both grew up in little uh, fast food establishments, hamburger stand, Chinese restaurant. And, uh, and so I believe, and we talked about the miracle of democracy, and some of this is the evidence because we've come through those crises, but some of it is my faith. It is my faith in America. And so uh, I'm hopeful I'm hopeful as we prepare for future crises. Part of that is we got to know that the crises are coming. And now I think we're very clear-eyed clear about that. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, cautiously, carefully, guardedly, but extremely optimistic. I am too. And I, I'm going to pick up where you left off and close with this. I don't think it's a matter of faith. We have proof. We have proof in our own lives. We, we discovered this bond uh, last night because I, I stopped the ambassador in the hallway at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and I said, hey, we got to give a talk at Brown Believe tomorrow. it or not, we actually prepared for this. We <laughs> I was like, pages I was of like, Norm, what are we going to talk about tomorrow? <laughs> and, and so we got to talking very quickly we discovered that he grew up in a hamburger stand in LA and your dad died and you, you dropped out of high school, worked for two years running the, the hamburger stand, then went back to high school and then found your way to Brown. I grew up in a Chinese restaurant. My parents ran first a small takeout joint, then a, a larger place. And before I went away to school, I worked side by side with my parents in that restaurant. So many people at Brown share our story. And I'll close with the way I closed my speech on election night last week. Um, the beauty of this country, the, we, the reason why we don't just have faith, we have proof, is that in one generation, we went from a hamburger stand to being a US ambassador. In one generation, I went from a hot Chinese restaurant kitchen in Hartford, Connecticut, to the Attorney General's office. And, and that's not possible anywhere else in this world. It's not. It's not. It's only possible here. Well, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for having us. Invite us back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.